Woody Harrelson, smallest dick I've ever seen on a man. Welcome in to the Bro Four Squad podcast, where we're just a bunch of bros drinking beer and talking movies. I am your host, the Mayor Jeff Hornacek. This is episode 208. Thank you guys so much for joining us for the movie discussion. And before we get started, as is tradition, we need to go around and meet the fellow bros. We start with the American hero, Nate Thurmond. Nate, is there anything more American than fighting a stranger at an Ed Sheeran concert? Um, no, that's about as American as it gets. You uh, bring in fighting Americans and the British, and I mean, that's where it all started. All, all history before 1776 is, is a lie, so. Yeah. I actually heard from someone, this is true, well, maybe not true, but like I actually did hear this. Someone said that of all the concerts they've been to in like, the last few years, the one with the most assholes at it was an Ed Sheeran concert. <laughs> it's interesting. Which is kind of weird. Get the fuck over yourself. And next we go, speaking of fighting, to our enforcer in the paint, Matt Geiger. Now, Geiger, how embarrassed would you be if for this past 4th of July you went to a firework stand and it didn't have any Husker do's or Husker, Husker don'ts with or without the fizzle stick? I, I mean, it's not what you want. It's the consumer. And I'm the <laughs> consumer. I want things that go boom and bang. <clears throat> Probably before every 4th of July, and every time I used to go to the county fair, I'd watch Joe Dirt, because that movie just tackles everything. And I kind of forgot, because I don't know if he's in anything else, but Kid Rock, for I don't think ever acting before, plays a really good rock. He's perfect in that. Yeah. He's like Kareem in um, Airplane. Airplane, I'm like, I, yeah. I'm just Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, he is like, actually does a really good job. The line where he like, uh, stops his car in front of Joe Dirt and like kicks up that gravel in his face, and Joe goes, I'm cool. He goes, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> underrated movie Geiger what's the line you always quote where he's reading the letter to Brandy dear Brandy if you, you, like really read. If you <laughs> XO XO we used to always say in high school is like when you, it's like you crying boy he's like and he's wearing the Def Leppard shirt like Def sucks get the fuck out of here forgot about that yeah, has he I'm trying to think has he actually been in anything else Kid Rock in anything else that I could think of. It's almost like Eminem and 8 Mile. Like, like I can't think of another film he was in. But he's really good. Once you peak, what's the point <laughs> even yeah. wasting your time anymore? Call it a day. All right, guys. Here on the Bro4 Squad podcast, we start every episode off with the most important thing in any bro's life. And that is chest day. Our chest day topic today, as you could probably tell by the title of this episode, we are going to do one of our good old-fashioned fantasy drafts. This one will be overdrafting the greatest sitcoms ever. Now, I will link the Google Sheets in the description of this episode with the final results of the draft, but don't click on that unless you want it spoiled for you. Um, so if you want to listen along live to the draft, avoid clicking on that just yet. But what the three bros and I are going to do is we have taken pretty much the greatest sitcoms of all time, put them into four different time periods. We have the 80s and earlier then we have the 90s. There was enough there to give that its own decade. Then we have 2000 to 2010, and then 2010 to the present. So there's four distinctive time periods. The three of us are going to draft. Uh, we're going to do a snake draft, meaning when you pick at the end of a round, you get to pick again at the first of the next round. And we're going to put together a team of five sitcoms. Uh, we're going to try and get one from at least three of these different time periods. And really the only criteria here is you want to put together what you feel is the best and most solid group of five. So before we get started, Geiger, you're going to have the first pick. People at home are probably already starting to think of their favorite sitcoms. <clears throat> one caveat I want to put on this, because as I was looking up lists of the most popular sitcoms of all time, we excluded cartoons from this i'm not sure exactly what defines a sitcom matt do you have like a more stringent definition than me you're a pretty big sitcom guy i would consider it just like almost real life family sitcoms like most of these i'm looking at to a point you know are about mother father kids. i mean some of them aren't a couple of them or about you know a job or something that they're working at mm -hmm. but it's real Something that could happen in real life. Like, there's not a fucking dinosaur in the show. Um, the one I always think of, I, I'm not going to even say that this is, and I'm actually adding it to the list right now, but I don't think this is necessarily the best sitcom, but one that I always think of that, like, is um, 
like the most quintessential of what a sitcom is is married with children where it's like guy with that's his actually, family yeah. that's an 80s sitcom well it is they when it started yeah it's kind of tricky with a lot of these that were like late 80s early 90s Crossover. a couple of them were like late 90s yeah but yeah nate how about you when you think sitcom is there like a particular well you don't have to say one that pops in your head but like what kind of defines the genre for you um yeah that's a good question i mean really just the word sitcom itself which comes i mean situational comedy and like that's what it's like based around is like certain situations and that kind of goes like what you guys what you and Geiger were saying like it's actual situations in like real life that people get into so that's why most of them are married around like families or close group close knit group of friends or something like that because yeah it's just relatable comedy that you can get into because you're like oh shit i sit on a couch and watch tv oh i go to a coffee shop and hang out with people yeah and i think sadly like the day of the sitcom is kind of over like i don't know if you guys had one that like either your family would always sit down to watch on a certain night of the week or if you just knew like all right tgif i always remember i don't i can't think that was on abc that was like yeah. the block of like three or four shows that like if you didn't watch it like you were a fucking loser next week you know we don't really have that anymore because a lot of people have cut the cord and everything's just kind of on demand with streaming but that was kind of yeah. like a a really nostalgic time for me with sitcoms oh yeah all right geiger you're up first you get to pick anything on the board the one one number one overall pick which could end up being called a bust in a few years uh, any, what are you going to go with? Say that again? Any genre that I want. Yep. yep. Anything. I'm I'm probably... I'll, I'll go with Cheers, and this is why, over a lot of the other shows on here that I really enjoy. Simply because episode one is just as good as the last episode. Episode five on season two is just as good as the second to last episode and the second to last season, whenever they switch, I mean, you could have a honest discussion at a bar. If, um, Christy Alley or Shelly Long was better. You could have an honest discussion at a bar. If Woody Harrelson or coach was better. So when they switch and bring in new characters and ship out the old ones, they don't miss, miss a beat. In fact, it's almost like a Sammy Hagar, David Lee Roth, like, who, dude, they both were fucking good in their own way. Now, and, I'm, I'm going to feel like an idiot for this, because I know Frasier is a spinoff of Cheers. Was Coach also? No, that's a different oh, okay. coach. Uh, his, it, it was, he helped Sam run the bar, and he l led the major leagues in hit-by-pitches, so he's kind of slow and dumb. <laughs> like he hit the block. And then he became the coach of the Red Sox, and he was Sam's coach. But he was, like, hilarious. Then Woody was just kind of the dumb Midwestern bumpkin that came in, obviously spawned off Woody Harrelson. Probably the, I mean, I would say the biggest actor in that. I mean, Christy Alley kind of had her thing. Ted Danson kind of had his thing. Woody Harrelson's still, you know, going and kicking. But I love that sitcom, and it's still funny today because it's just set at a bar, and it's yeah. something that's almost timeless. And something that whenever I visit Boston, I really want to go see. That's yeah. a good one, one. I mean, I universally pretty well loved ran forever had an incredible spinoff series which also might get picked at some point and yeah just the simple concept of like hanging out at a bar it's about the regulars and the people who work there like to me that is like perfect setup and looking at some stuff i mean you have to say like as they went on or you know the kids got older or you know the one mom got shipped out for another actress like you could definitely say it's like okay the last couple seasons kind of lost their flair you can't say that about cheers like cheers was phenomenal yeah like every season Absolutely. All right, Thurman, you are up. Cheers is off the board. Mm. Great pick there. Um, obviously, in the 80s and earlier, there are not as many that we will probably connect with. <clears throat> Just going back um, a little before we were born. But um, I'm going to dip my toe in the 80s and earlier as well. Um, I'm going to take I Love Lucy. Great now, pick. My mom loved this growing up, so I've literally seen every episode of this multiple times um so yeah it has a special place in my heart and then just culturally like what lucy and desi did for like the the tv industry and what lucy did for like women in that industry like she was i mean she was basically the boss of their production company she was the boss of that show which you did not see back then so right um as much as some other old, older ones on here are 
kind of timeless and iconic. Um, I think that did a lot for a lot of people. And like I said, it holds a special place in my heart because I've seen every episode five to ten times. So. And the conveyor belt scene is an iconic piece of. Oh yeah, content. there's so many. You've got that one. You've got the vitamin vitamin vegemin uh, one where she gets drunk on the on the commercial. Um, yeah, you've got a like ton of good ones. And, and yeah, it was cool because they didn't. They were like in their apartment in New York for the longest time. But then there were a couple of seasons where they traveled around and they were in Italy for a while. And that's where you get the famous uh, grape smashing the wine scene. Um, yeah, she's smashing the grapes and everything. So I mean, yeah, there's so many timeless and iconic scenes and and photos that are pulled from that so that's a that's a good one damn so you guys both not only got it's we have to have at least three time periods represented you got your maybe the the thinnest one at least in terms of us in terms of 80s and earlier and two pretty big heavy hitters there <clears throat> so what i'm gonna do since i have back-to-back -back picks even though i don't like one of these sitcoms i'm trying to build the best team and i'm gonna go best player available which i think any uh smart team would do with this much talent still left on the board. I'm going to start with Seinfeld. The sitcom essentially about nothing. Yeah. Um, I understand that this is a sitcom that some people might watch and just literally do not understand where the laughs are coming from. But it resonates with me, and there is no doubt it is iconic. I mean, every, I think, actor in this is cast so perfectly, almost too perfect to the point where, like, how aside from like the stuff that happened per, in his personal life, how could Michael Richards or Jason Alexander have ever had an acting career outside of this? Because they are their characters on. Yeah. Set. Yeah. That they, they forever after that, they're going to be typecast because they just fit into that so well. And they embodied that and they played that character for so long. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, arguably the you know, most iconic 90s sitcom. And I wasn't like huge into it. I've honestly maybe seen like, 10 or 20 episodes here and there um but i mean i get it i get the irreverence about it and that's what's funny to people is like the the shit that they get into and like they make bigger deals out of small things and then obviously just the show about nothing essentially. right matt you're a seinfeld guy right i i can't stand Seinfeld. oh really <laughs> <laughs> okay hey, i just like to watch i had a roommate in college that every season and i yeah, no. It's like when Napoleon Dynamite for me. I'm like, I get that you're trying to be funny, but I just don't. No. <laughs> All right, well, I'm gonna, for my next pick, I'm going to pivot. I was going to take uh, a sitcom that I actually don't like, but I'm going to do this for Cycli and myself, and I'm going to stay with the 90s, and I'm going to go with The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air as my second pick. Iconic theme song, obviously started the career of Will Smith. The laughs are a mile a minute. It could also really tug at your heartstrings. There's some really good... Um, father figure moments with uncle phil and will uh and again alphonse i think a, another key component i think to a lot of sitcoms is they took an actor who's really not that talented and made them funny or hilarious and punch above their weight and is there a better example of that than alfonso ribeiro as carlton i mean that guy's resorted to hosting like 11 p.m game shows on the game show network now but if you watch an episode of fresh prince of bel-air the way he is utilized he's hilarious it's like a you get to go to each every year too and do the Carlton on like whole eleven. <laughs> yeah, he has to just feel yeah. like he's being used when they ask him to do that. Oh yeah, yeah. I think he's probably used to it to this point. But yeah, he plays in like every pro am there is out in California. Any chance he gets, he's he's a big golfer. Oh really? I didn't know that. Yeah, good for him. It's Great pick though. Great pick. every year. So I have Seinfeld and the Fresh Prince of Bel Air both from the '90s. So I probably I can only have one more pick from that decade to fill out my team nate we go back to you who will be joining i love lucy on team thurmond man this is a tough one um it, i think at this point i know we've only been through like a round and a pick but there's a lot of sitcoms that are just not differentiating themselves for me yeah i'm probably gonna have to go with just best available out there right now in my opinion i'm gonna go ahead and take the office um, now, and I know a lot of people's opinions after Michael left, it kind of fell off. I still really enjoyed it. Um, there are some issues I have. I, the move with Andy to the manager is a little weird. Um, but, I mean, th this one was so such a front runner in the documentary style. 
and actually have, did have a documentary about it. Now you see other shows, Parks and Rec, Modern Family, and a ton of other ones that still do the floating heads, um, that do the documentary style, but they never mention anything of a documentary. Um, the office figured out this formula and they saw it was successful and people were just copying it and like throwing to the wind that they actually need to say there's a documentary or anything. Like, why are these people being interviewed? Like, fuck it. It's funny. Um, well, Jim, Jim made it work by like looking at the camera all the time. Yeah. That was his... and, that, and that was great. And I think that is one of the things that makes it easier for other or makes it appealing for other comedies to do it because you can look at the camera. Um, but the yeah the, the the universe that the offices have created i mean that's that's one of the ones that i've watched six seven times front to back yeah uh, that's just the one that you throw on you don't have anything else to watch you're cooking you're cleaning or something and uh you just throw it on and you can quote every single every single episode of every single season so see now i'm kicking myself because i feel like i could have got fresh prints in the turnaround and i should have gone with the office mm, but yeah i feel like the fucking new york jets god damn it you're <clears> lost <throat> All right, so Nate, you have I Love Lucy in the office. I put U.S., but no one's here is picking the British <laughs> office, especially Geiger, who hates the Brits, but that, they fired the first shot there. All right, Matt, you have cheers already. You get two picks. Who is joining them on your team? I'm glad Seinfeld's off the board because I'm going to hit you with some facts here. This is, one, this is, I believe, the only show that ever beat Seinfeld in its prime, kind of consistent, consistently. In the ratings? And this man is the first and only probably ever person to have the number one movie, number one sitcom, and number one book all at the same time. I'm moving over right now because I remember you telling me that fact before. <laughs> you, you already knew that? No, well, you taught me that. Okay, yeah. It was the yeah. Santa Claus. His book came out because my dad had it. Cause he's a big Tim Allen fan. Of course, Home Improvement. Loved you know what his book is called, by chance? I can't remember what the book is called. But, I mean, he... Yeah. He has a really interesting life prior to even becoming. Yeah, I mean, he got caught with cocaine that he was in supposed to be in jail for a while. And it was like right before it was like during he. I know he's a stand up comic. I can't believe I can't remember if he came from the comedy store in L.A. that, uh, you know, um, Polly Shore's mom ran forever. Yeah, that that's right. Yeah, I think she still up. does run it. If she's a, I heard yes. someone talking about her a few years ago. Um, I can't remember what if he came. Obviously, he's from Michigan, but if he went to L.A. and did that, but. That kind of like was going to ruin his whole chances. They and that's a Disney show. It's on the Disney app, like yeah. Disney. App oh, really? show. Yeah, <clears throat> Davis Johnson, Taylor Thomas. Um, just a fantastic show. Rewatching it now, watching it as a kid, I always felt like my dad was kind of like Tim Allen. I was Jonathan Taylor Thomas. Now watching it as an adult, it just takes on a whole new meaning. Fucking hilarious <laughs> show. Yeah. A very like manly show. I'd consider it maybe like a two and a half men of its age. But yeah. Tim Allen man was fantastic. I mean, he basically played the same character in the Santa Claus, the first one. That's why that movie is so good. And snake drafting, once again, since I Love Lucy's off the board, I'm going to take another, I, I, I feel like an iconic show because it paved the way for so much, and that's Roseanne, for a okay. couple of reasons. Wow. Uh, first up, were you shocked that that was 80s and earlier? To me, that I felt like that was mid-90s, but when I looked it up, it was... No, nah, it was... I mean, it went on for a really long time because it's a successful show. And in the golden age of sitcoms, you know, it just seemed like everything was in California. The only ones before that with women led or I believe like Mary Tyler Moore, um, I Love Lucy. But it was more, you know, the housewives and stuff. This was Midwest in a trailer. She works at a diner, you know, just trying to scavenge through life, just trying to, you know, paycheck to paycheck. And coming from the Midwest myself, like, Remember my aunts and everyone just loved this show because it was one of the first raunchy, you know, shows that's like, oh, it's a show about a woman. So she's going to be like all prissy and stuff. No, like it's going to be down and dirty. It gave us a lot of great actors to um, comedians. I see Clooney came from this. Uh, Tom Arnold, Goodman. There was a, a list of people. <coughs> that came from this show. Wait, um, Clooney did this before ER? Yes. Oh, I this was one of his first things. Interesting. And that's what's really weird is Roseanne and Clooney were really good friends because he was like either a comic or an actor that was like just like starving. And Roseanne's like, you can come on my show. And, you know, political views, they're like very far apart. I don't know if they're friends <laughs> anymore. They were like really good friends. Oh, huh, that's crazy. I, I, you, I think you mentioned it, but obviously John Goodman as well. Yeah. Fantastic in this. Yeah. And the kids, you know, the kids aren't. I mean, they're just, you know. 
poor kids. Like it's just a totally different sitcom than I when I when I think back on it that I've ever seen before. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, all right. So choice there. you have Cheers, Home Improvement, and Roseanne. Uh, Nate, you have I Love Lucy and the U.S. Office. Who is going to be joining them? Hmm. Man, that is a tough one. Um, God, there's still a lot of good ones out there. I don't know if I want to play to the audience or play to my heart. And you already have two different time per- periods. You have uh, your yeah. 80s and earlier and your 20, 2000, 2010. So that's not really a limitation you have to worry about. Um, God, I don't want to. Let's see here. Is it just me or do the 2010s to present? <clears throat> even though there's some good shows there, they just. They to me that feels like the weakest. Well, they yeah, they're the television for reason from like the '60s to early '90s. Yeah, yeah, in the 2010s, there's like two that are sticking out quite a bit. Um, but I think I'm gonna have to go. I'm gonna go dip my toe back in the 2000s and take. Ah, do, yeah, I'm gonna take Scrubs. Dang it! <laughs> that was gonna be my next pick. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think this is just a very well-rounded show. Um, I think it appeals to a lot of different people. Um, and I, I think I've heard this from multiple sources, but like, just even though it's a, a straight comedy, what is, what situationally is done in there is very close to like how a hospital is, um, maybe a little bit more behind the scenes, obviously not the patient, not, not the patient view. Um, but the way they have to laugh and the way they have to make jokes to get through the shit that they go through. Right. Um, and, and, uh, and JD and Turk's relationship, that was one of the best bromances in like any sitcom I've ever seen. Well, it was real too. Like yeah. Zach F and Donald Faison are actually best friends. In real yeah. Life. And so it worked so well. They gelled so well together. They like held the show together. Um, so well but um that, that was one of the ones i mean big laughs also big cries i mean there were there were some very emotional touching moments all throughout the seasons um last couple of seasons kind of fell off going to college or medical school whatever that was but um very very solid 95 percent. good pick um all right so i have seinfeld and the fresh prince of bel-air both from the 90s <clears throat> what i'm gonna do is go with maybe the oldest sitcom on here Although I could be mistaken. And uh, at least, Matt, for me, iconic intro and something that I always remember watching on TV Land as a kid and still think it was funny. That is the Andy Griffith Show. Wow. <laughs> One of Mayberry, baby. Man. I flirted, I flirted with that one earlier. That's a good yeah. one. Uh, my dad got me into this. He loved to watch it on TV Land. I thought about adding on here one of my dad's favorite sitcoms but i don't think it's as popular as other people just because if you think about it now the subject matter is like we made a comedy show out of that and that was hogan's heroes oh yeah i never really watched that one of mash yeah mash was great too i was thinking about that but to, for me for my 80s and earlier sitcom the andy griffith show was just iconic the town of mayberry barney fife the whistling intro um mm-hmm. one of the first sitcoms that really had like mass appeal and I think actually we might not even have this draft if it weren't for the Andy Griffith show. So I have Seinfeld, the Fresh Prince of Bel Air, and the Andy Griffith show. Um, and not to mention Ron Howard. That's right. Oh, yeah. yeah. All right. Where am I going to go here? Okay. I'm going to go. This is one of my favorite sitcoms. I've seen it all the way through several times from the 2000s to 2010. So this will get me three different decades. And that is Modern Family. Hmm. Also, the mockumentary style, mm-hmm. similar to The Office. Phil Dunphy, I would say, is maybe the most underrated TV sitcom dad. He is fucking hilarious. And yeah. when he introduces his book, Phil's Osophy, and I think season four or five, and it's just his, like, <laughs> pieces of wisdom that he has. It's incredible. Now, I will say about this show, like, not every character works for me, like, Cameron and Mitchell, I love Cam. I really can't stand Mitchell. Phil and really? Claire, uh, Claire kind of gets on my nerves, but I love his daughters and Luke. So it's like, you know, not every sitcom you're going to love every single character, but the nice thing about this is because of, I think it had, if you talk about ensemble cast, every single character I think was pretty much given equal devotion to their stories throughout. So yeah. if you didn't like a specific character, then it really wasn't a problem because they all kind of had equal billing in Modern Family. 
I love Cam and Mitchell. I love Mitchell because one of my friends in high school who happened to be gay, like people don't understand, like not every gay person is the most flamboyant person in the room. Like some yeah. of them are just gay. And they're like, <laughs> and they're just gay. so much of him. Now he's actually gay in real life and Cam's not. Right. After the, uh, that's probably why, but they're well, dynamic. That would be tough to play. Yeah. And, like, I have never seen a sitcom where every character is like uh, not character development, but just the way they're written and stuff is like so different, mm-hmm. but the way they bring it together makes sense. And I love that it's called modern family. Cause now modern family is like, yeah, man, like people are divorced. Like here's the new stepmom who's fucking Gloria. And it's like, it's, it's a very well written show for sure. And yeah. Jay Pritchett. I just, I love Jay Pritchett, man. I mean, I love Ed O'Neill in general, but he, uh, He's just awesome in the show. His relationship with Phil, how Phil is constantly pining for his approval and Jay is so reluctant to give it, but it doesn't deter Phil at all. <laughs> it's just a funny concept. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're running through. We're on like season nine right now, I think. We're finishing it out for the first time. Oh, nice. Is it is it still on Hulu? Uh, yeah, I think so. Maybe Peacock, too. I think that's what we're watching. Um, that I watched when I was on, but I've never binged it. It's a good binge show, man. We, my, the wife and I, watched it a few years back, where we just like, as we were eating, we would have like an episode or two on in the background. And I yeah. think Nate, did you say season nine is the last season? That sounds right. Nine or ten, I think. Yeah, I can't remember. We're close. I don't think I've ever seen an episode I didn't like. Yeah. And talk about a show like as it got more popular, so many cool um, celebrity cameos on that show. Mm-hmm. So many great ones. Um, did they? One last thing. Did they direct? lily to be a bad actor to be a bad actress dude i have to think because they had like three different lilies and i, I can't some of them she's a toddler but she's horrible man and then they stuck with them just like this is what they're giving us with like this great ensemble i'm like there are better kid actors out there it is yeah, I thought luke was awful when Who? he got old he couldn't stand him luke yeah he, oh. was, he was yeah he became really kind of useless once he hit, hit high school I agree with that too. Yeah. But when he's younger, him and Phil's dynamic is great. Like the episode where the possum is under their house and they try and get it out. Yeah. I mean, that's the one problem I had with home improvement. As they got older, like the kids were older. They just act like John Taylor Thomas, but they, they did like really important issues and it wasn't as funny anymore. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. This isn't, it's always funnier when the kids are younger. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, Nate, you are up. Uh, you have already added I Love Lucy. The U.S. Office and Scrubs. Um, you have two different time periods here. You have the 80s and over, and then 2000, 2010. You have two picks left. You'll make one of them here. Who will be joining them on Team Thurmond? That's a tough one. Um, I've narrowed it down. Going back to the 90s here. Um, There's still some heavy hitters in the 90s, man. Oh, there are. I'm going to... This one I know kind of splits splits the audience sometimes, but I'm going to pick it just because of how big it is. We're going to go with Friends. We're going to take Friends. Yeah, I mean it. It lasted too long, if we're being honest. Yeah. I don't think any yeah. of us are huge fans of it, but you can't deny its importance in the sitcom landscape. Um, we uh, never seen a lot of them, never laughed. Same. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we uh, we ran sometimes through this. makes me laugh. Sorry, it was put on I don't know Netflix or something eight or so years ago, and we ran through it. I ran through it for the first time. And yeah, it's not my favorite, but yeah, I definitely enjoyed it. It was, it was good. But it's, I know it's very polarizing. It was just so iconic to like pop culture in the 90s. But mm-hmm. yeah, like Geiger said, outside of Chandler, I just... And I think another thing too, I'll totally admit this freely. People love it so much that I'm some a lot of times like, can you just shut the fuck up? Like, <laughs> stop. Stop yelling pivot. Yeah, I'm just a casual fan. Right. All right, Geiger, you're up. Your last two picks here, you have Cheers, Home Improvement, and Roseanne. Uh, you do need to add a, another time period. So you have the 80s and 90s. So one of these two picks will have to be from 2000, 2010, or 2010 to present. Again, you're yes. going to round out your team here. What are you going with? Uh, present-ish. Silicon Valley. I knew you were wow. going to go. Wow. Oh, yeah. One of my <laughs> favorite shows. Um Talk about something that's happening now. I mean, the tech boom is huge. It happens in California. And if anything else, TJ Miller's performance and whoever plays Gavin Bolson, <laughs> the mm-hmm. boss really, is just, he's so like, I don't know, Elon Musk. And whenever 
he had the fight with the other guy about how long it would take to get to Jackson Hole. So he just basically he just did a summit about climate control. And then he just drove his jet to and from Jackson Hole and timed it five times to prove that he was, <laughs> that he could get there. Is like the is like so so like upper echelon California people and stuff. Such a fantastic show, man. We got um a lot of actors that are probably not too well known, but the only really good character I, actors. Yeah, the only thing I have a problem with it sometimes is it's so like anxiety filled that they never get a win. Like it just seems like. But I guess that's kind of the point of the um, of the sitcom and stuff. But yeah, they're all self destructing, right? <laughs> if you have an entrepreneurial mind like I kind of do and stuff, it's very interesting how you know the ebbs and flows of starting your own business and how much of a pain in the ass it is and how shit gets fucked up all the time and stuff. But God, it's a fantastic show. TJ, what? that's what TJ Miller, you know, a uh, movie star for a while until yeah. he went psycho. I still, I, I understand he's like had his really rough personal moments, but I still think TJ Miller is fucking hilarious. Um, one of the best comics we had for a while. A while. Was Camille one. Nanjiani on this show or was that a different show? Yeah, he's on this one. Oh, nice. Damn, that a good yep. cast. And so for one guest appearance was Lily from the AT&T commercials, who they really dumbed down those commercials. And she was a Satanist that slept with Gil Boyle. And she was like... <laughs> that yeah, idea alone is hilarious. This uh, this is tough to say because there's so many other great TV shows and sitcoms out there. This may have one of my favorite TV scenes ever in the is it dick the dicks to floor. per minute, yeah. the dick to floor, dick to floor ratio. Yeah. Um, or what about the, uh, what is it called whenever um, you're doing a business theory thing? It's like they were doing the business theory thing on if they should tell the what is it, the motocross guy that the jump's going to kill him because they might be able to bang his girlfriend? Oh my God. SWAT analysis. The SWAT analysis. SWAT they, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities. Oh, threat. there you go. Nice. Yeah. Gil was going to just go tell him, like, hey, this math doesn't make sense. Like, you're going to kill yourself. And he's a dick to him. And Gil was like, oh, I don't know if I should tell him now. I might just like, <laughs> they had to do a SWAT analysis on it. This is an H- was this an HBO original? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so. I'm gonna have to catch up on this on Max because I've seen a lot of clips of this. Nate, you showed me the dick to is it dick to floor? I just remember the clip of him. Yeah, they do like dick to floor, but then they get to like how many dicks they can jerk off like per minute. Right. It's you showed me that numbers. that clip, and I was like, all right, yeah, this is my show. <laughs> and then just Matt describing SWOT analysis of if you're gonna do you want to fuck a motocross guy's girlfriend when he dies? Like that's that this type was of dark like one of their biggest pitches too. Like they knew they were fucked, <laughs> so they're just doing that. And Chin Yang and um. TJ Miller's relationship is fucking hilarious too, but yeah. it's, it's a fantastic show. That's a good one. Told you. <laughs> All right, guy, you can go anywhere you want on the board. You have Cheers, Home Improvement, Roseanne, and Silicon Valley. What will join them as the last sitcom on your greatest sitcoms ever draft? I'm going to go in the 90s. I just don't know where I want to go because yeah. so many of these, uh, so many of these I love, and so many of these are so iconic that. I'm leaning. I don't know if that '70s show, Boy Meets World, Full House. They both. I'm gonna. I'm gonna do that '70s show. Damn it! That was gonna be my last pick. Just, just because I think if, if you tell me right now, gun to my head, you gotta watch a full season of something of all these. I agree. I would pick that '70s show. Yeah. And like it, it got kind of bad too. Like when Eric left and everything, but the first, you know, couple seasons. The reason I love it so much is coming from the Midwest. I mean, they're in Wisconsin, but it just reminds me of high school. Even though it's in the 70s, you're just in a basement. You're smoking pot. You're trying to find beer. You're talking about stupid (laughs) shit the whole time. Yeah. You know, we're watching Gilligan's Island. Like, who would they bang? Ginger, whoever. Like, we do that on shows and stuff. Like, it just really captured it. And it's actually a show I found really late. Like, it was – I mean, Ashton Kutcher was already doing butterfly effect and shit whenever I, I knew of the show. And my college roommate had like every season. He's like, you got to watch the show. Dude. And I just fell in love with it. So and what you just described is exactly Banner and I in college. So Banner is the biggest that 70s show fan that I know. He has every DVD of it. And in college, when I roomed with him, he let me borrow it. And I watched it all in like two weeks, basically. Right. And Very I think easy to watch. And I hope you guys pick on some, some of the as 90s kids. I mean, it sucks that Boy Meets World and Full House. I mean, Family Matters is a great show, too. I always watch that. But. There's a I'll lot of great 
the 90s. If any of those sitcoms are undrafted, they're getting an invite from Team Hornacek to come to camp and work out with yes. us. Or um, logo they got. <laughs> one last thing I'll say about that 70s show, and then Nate, if you want to add anything. Um, another cool thing that worked about that show, and I think often like just because of how um, great the per- comedic performances were by the main cast, like even Wilmer Valderrama, who I can't stand, he is hilarious as Fez. But what was so great about that show, arguably maybe the best part, is Red and Kitty. Right? The, because the dynamic we can all relate to is when you're a teenager, basically your entire goal of existence is to be mischievous and not have your parents find out. And seeing that from also the lens of Red and Kitty in that 70s show was just something I think we really got in sitcoms and was – fuck. I mean – I, he's a different type of sitcom father, but Red Foreman is like in a league of his own in terms of sitcom dads. He still has one of my favorite quotes that I use all the time. I actually told to my two year old the other day. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, Eric d- was doing something he didn't want to do. And he's like, Eric, let me tell you something. Being a man is all about doing crap you don't want to do, like <laughs> 90, which is true. Like, as you get older, like most of the stuff I do, like go to work or yeah or something like i don't want to do any of this <laughs> i just I gotta see a bunch of baseball we do games. like 80 percent of the shit we don't want to do so that we can have like the 15 20 percent of time to do the stuff we do on it it's yeah of your life just to maybe watch a youtube clip or something <laughs> yeah, it's basically what it sums up to all right so matt your final team i mean pretty solid you got cheers home improvement roseanne silicon valley and that 70s show Got some heavy hitters there. All right, Nate, your final pick. Who will be joining I Love Lucy, the U.S. Office, Scrubs, and Friends on your team? Man, this is a tough one. I've literally been sitting here the whole time (laughs) trying to figure this out. Oh, man. I'm really struggling with my last pick. (sighs) Let's see here. Man, yeah, I mean, there's still so many good ones out there. We could build a team of 10 and still have a lot of heavy hitters. Um, at the end of the day, I'm going to have to go with Parks and Rec. Okay. I'm glad that 2010 to, to present had a second one pick because if Geiger only took Shit's Creek, I would feel bad for that time period. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. Parks and Rec. I mean, it, it holds up with the office. I mean, it's always has the same create uh, creator, Greg Daniels. Um, still has that same mockumentary style. Um, and, and the characters in the characters in Parks and Rec are even more ridiculous, I think, than the characters in The Office. Um, they just kind of took it one notch up. Um, and as I was sitting here looking at this, the last season, they kind of botched it a little bit. They had like a, I don't know, probably a contract dispute or something. It was like well, a couple years later. Was that when Chris Pratt was filming Guardians in London? So they had to like move the show to London, basically, to accommodate his schedule? That wasn't the last season. Um, the last season, I think it was kind of split, but they jumped like seven years in the future or something. It was kind of weird. Um, but that was kind of deterring me from picking these. But some of the other ones I was I was toying with, it was like they kind of all fall off at the end. They're not as Correct. great at the beginning. Um, well, so the really are. successful ones have cast members that they just can't afford anymore. That's what happens. Yeah, exactly. Um, but this one, I mean, the core cast stuck through for almost from the beginning to the end. Um Obviously, at the beginning, um, Rob Lowe and Adam Scott weren't there, but they were introduced very quickly. And it's funny because I remember like watching the show, and I, oh, guest star Rob Lowe and Adam Scott, and then they became part of the full ensemble. Um, but it was just so well, well-rounded, even as ridiculous as the characters were. Um, it was it was fantastic, and I hold it in the same regard as The Office. Yeah, I think the uh, – was you might have said this. Sorry if I missed it. Was Greg Daniels also behind Parks and Rec? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Creatively, it looked the same. Um, all right, so your final team, I Love Lucy, The Office. So you have The Office and Parks and Rec. That's cool. The Office, Scrubs, Friends, and Parks and Rec. Uh, my last sitcom pairing with Seinfeld, The Fresh Prince, The Andy Griffith Show, and Modern Family uh, is going to be my favorite sitcom of all time. And while it is, I would argue, one of the funnier ones on here, unequivocally, I don't even think this is up for debate, it has the most interesting and creative framing device and narrative structure of any sitcom on this list, and that is How I Met Your Mother, where, of course, the plot device is the entire time we are being told a story from the year 2028 by future Ted Mosby, and it's his journey to meet uh, his the mother of his children, who he's narrating the story to. 
I will not spoil the ending. There's a big twist at the end of it. But part of the fun along the way is all the hijinks that him and his friends get into and dating and personal relationships in New York City. And Barney Stinson is probably a top 20 sitcom character of all time, I would argue, in terms of hilarity, although he's done some horrible things as well. Um, So my list, I know that it doesn't have the... And I'm kind of have the blinders on because cycling i love this show so much but it's not as popular as i thought it was but for me it is my favorite sitcom i think i've seen it all the way through four times um and it has a 215 episodes or so um so that's i just couldn't put together my team if i didn't include how i met your mother yeah the uh i mean i I love how i met your mother as well i I figured that was going to be your your last one there um but this like like i was uh talking about earlier uh, now i can't even remember oh silicon valley maybe one of the my, the funniest scenes i've ever seen in, in a sitcom um i don't know if, this is definitely probably top three or so but not to spoil anything for anyone who hasn't seen it but in how i met your mother whenever ted goes to an apartment and has like a monologue in one of the last two episodes very touching oh boy yep yeah get the waterworks coming that's so what talking about that's, that's, a very, that's, a, that's a very good monologue and a very good scene right there yeah this one is probably of all the sitcoms has some of the most gut-wrenching emotional beats in it of any of them. I think that's one of the things I love about it too. Geiger, I know I don't think we've ever like really drilled down. What are your thoughts on how I made my that? You probably haven't seen it all the way through, but you've probably poked around at it. Yeah, something I never really stopped down to watch, but I watched it with you. Um it's not like one of on my Mount Rushmore, but I appreciate its greatness. And I definitely agree like the way on episode one, it's like here's where we're going. You know, on The Office on episode one, you know, that's not where they're going to go in episode three. They, you know, drive. Yeah. They don't know where they're going to go. They might get canceled. Like any <laughs> yeah. no changes. This is like, this is what the story is. You actually got to stay along. There's going to be laughs right along the way. But I almost like say it's hard to say it's a comedy. There's a lot of laughs, but it actually has a built in story. Like the whole time, it's almost suspenseful and stuff. And you want to know more. It's very interesting. I did see the last episode. It's kind of cheating because I haven't watched the whole thing. But I I recognize this greatness for sure and how unique it is, which is really cool. Yeah, it's definitely not the most laughable. Also. Yeah. All right. So before we end, I just thought this would be a funny exercise because I already know the one that I'm going to pick. And I'm wondering if we'll all pick the same one. But looking at the list of what's left. So like the popular sitcoms, not things that got canceled after like one episode or a season. What sitcom is the absolute worst or like worst sitcom on here or the biggest piece of shit? Like the one that if I told you you have to sit here and watch a whole season of that, you'd be like, just shoot me, kill me. Now, I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot, but Geiger, is there one on this list that jumps out of that every time you were looking over, you go over my dead body? Will I draft that? Nine Nine. Brooklyn Nine Nine? Wow. If, if, if there's a sitcom that is promoted during like a football game or something <laughs> on you know the mainstream i'm like dude i'm out like yeah. that, that, those days are over and <laughs> andy sandberg you know we've seen we've seen his fastball and he doesn't have another pitch <laughs> like you know sit dead red corona commercials now and i just i've seen a couple episodes i mean it's kind of funny but it's like okay a buddy cop that's funny like I've seen this a million times. No, thank you. Set, where's it set? New York, Boston, what, where the fuck? <clears throat> no, thanks. Yeah. Um, one interesting fact, there was actually an episode where Brooklyn Nine-Nine and New Girl crossed over. I only know because my wife watches New Girl and the Brooklyn Nine-Nine crew shows up in one yeah. episode. Nate, how about you? If I said one of these you have to watch and you go, I would rather die, poison me right now, what would it be? Um, hold on, let me double check here. I think I have it. Uh, oh, well, man, that is tough. Now that I'm seeing two of them. Uh, if Big not, Bang. I can go. Big Bang. Bang. Yeah, Big Bang Theory. Yeah. Biggest piece of shit in the world. And it, Geiger, I highly recommend you check this out because you love a good YouTube rabbit hole. YouTube Big Bang Theory without the laugh track. Oh my god. <laughs> This is nothing. I mean, you know how unfunny the show is, but that really... Po- how do these actors do it? I don't understand. Like, some of the lines they're forced to say... The, I know that they're nerds. Like, they, they're into comics and stuff. And Kayla Coke. Oh. Yeah. yeah, but she's not a nerd, and she's hot. Isn't that funny? Right. I, I, I've watched the show before, and of course, probably 
at some point does she date one of the nerds on like yep. season four? If, yeah. yeah. Um, I watched the show before and I'm just like, what, who is this for? <laughs> like, Actually, Geiger, if, if you go on our YouTube account and go to history of watched, I watched the screen rant pitch meeting. He did one of the big bang theory <laughs> and it's really, really good. It's but, bad. They're, they're just trying, I don't know. Is it like so they're friends? Gonna, like they're just living together or what's, you know? What's yeah. The so they're like, Nate, correct me if I'm wrong. Not that you know the show better than me, but you might just have be able to plug in the holes they're like astrophysicists who room together and then kaylee cuoco moves in across the hall and it's basically like yeah. the most simple premise it's like they're so smart but they don't understand social norms and she's the opposite pretty much yeah that's basically it. they try and make like highbrow jokes and they try and like do wordplay on like smart okay so i i scientific know stuff and it doesn't work i think colbert is fun that Sit at Starbucks for eight hours and on their laptops and sip coffee that yeah. are more intelligent than everyone. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. But if you go watch it without the la – like the jokes, I, it, it's almost like they're playing a prank on us to like be as unfunny as possible and see how many views they can – like because the thing lasted forever. I think it lasted yeah. 10 seasons. Yeah. And I remember every well, like, time it was on, I'm like, who the fuck watches this? Parsons was like at the time, at the time of the ending, like the highest paid sitcom actor – going or at the time it was insane talk about a one trick pony he goes 10 seasons on that show and he can't even get like bit parts in anything now yeah he's set for life so it's okay all right well that is the greatest sitcoms ever draft congratulations guys comment below after you click the link to see all of our teams on who you think had the best squad i will admit mine like to the objective fan probably not that it, it's not as star studded but for me those are at least four shows. I don't know how much of Seinfeld I could get through, but four shows I would probably watch start to finish. Anytime. Yeah. All right, we move on to our protein shake, where we go around and talk about what's in our cup, also known as what have we watched lately. Geiger, let's lead it off with you. What have you seen recently? Uh, I'll start off with what I've watched today. Um, I think I would have been a lawyer in my past life because I love courtroom cases. I mean... The O.J. Simpson one I was really into. Uh, the one where the lawyer supposedly killed the son, the Murdoch one, Johnny Depp Ooh. one. Oh, dude, so, there's a documentary on the Murdoch one you need to watch. Actually, I nominated it for Best Brosker this year. Okay. I you probably might have seen it. Um, it's on Netflix, yeah. It got in kind of a, whole, a dark period in my life when that case went on where I just didn't work and just searched YouTube theories about <laughs> it. But anyway, so I watched, uh, I don't know if it's fucking C-SPAN or something in my office today, but it was the uh, Live... PGA golf merger at Capitol Hill today, which is always fun. This was already on Capitol Hill. That's pretty and, quick. And I, I remember uh, on St. Patty's Day in like 2005 when they brought the MLB players with Conseco. And even then, I think I was like in eighth grade. I was like, why is Congress questioning these people when Congress sucks? Right. But here we are. And some of the stuff they brought up is just amazing how it's basically the the Saudi investment firm and PGA Jay Monahan just big dick at each other. We're like, okay, well I get this, you get this. And it's really nothing about the players. That's oh. really, not really what I want to talk about. It's this the whole time. I feel like the question is not being asked. Of course it's turned political now, like, Oh, let them get their money, which I'm all for a lot of other companies that we use every day that I'm not going to fucking boycott or whatever, like take money from the Saudi investment firm. You know, for one sure. is um, they're using right now, but isn't this a dangerous track to go down simply because what if overseas companies start owning NFL teams, start owning, you know, think about your sport that you care about. Even if you don't care about golf. That's why it's, even though these old white people aren't good people, most of them, the owners, they're still better <laughs> than having someone from China own it that like, what if China whole thing is like, oh, by the way, our football team's not playing this year because of something happening in China. We got to teach our people a lesson. We're not fucking doing it. Then it's like, then your team, like, say your team's like the Chargers and they're owned by China. They're like, fuck, the Chargers are owned by China. <laughs> like they're owned like by a Chinese corporates. Yeah. <laughs> but like, this is just a, a thing that, and I, I don't want government to get involved with business because they could barely handle the business of running a country. But it's like, I don't know what they're going to do with this. And it's just a dangerous track to go down when you're letting people that, you know, 
don't really have probably the best human rights views for the thing. Once again, I'm I'm perfectly fine with everyone getting their money because other corporations are too. I just want to see your guys' take because it's not about this. It's about what is going to come from this in like 10 or 20 years. And is this maybe the end to like sports as we know it? Even though these athletes do get paid a lot, there are some times in sports, the Masters, uh, the Field of Dreams game, you know, some of those like, man, this feels like something in the 1950s. This feels pure. Is that is this going to be the end of that? It could be because I know that, yeah, that's a that's a big conversation being had now. Like um, if the PGA is just I don't know all the ins and outs of it, but if they're backing down and just uh, accepting the fact that they're going to be working with the PIF now, um, what what what's stopping them from coming and saying, hey, here's 30 billion dollars NFL. What do you say about that? And they just start buying up teams or start having an interest in the NFL. I don't know if it'll affect anything, but it'll make things interesting for sure. Yeah, I liked the, and you guys know way more about like the golf aspect of it, but I liked the free market cap capitalism part of it that Matt was talking about where the PGA obviously has been unchallenged for probably forever. I don't know if anyone ever tried to start like a rival golf league and they just got steamrolled. So I liked the idea that like sort of the, the idea of the PGA was challenged by a, a, industry disruptor in live obviously like matt says though where the money is coming from raises a lot of questions about the stability of sports in north america and i don't care what anyone says and matt has said this for you know seven years since we've had the podcast everybody has a price so Mm -hmm. if someone comes literally it could be someone who's like yeah i just murder people for a living but here's 80 billion dollars she'd be like well all right they can buy this tonight and buy it (laughs) <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> so I appreciated the like the concept of live where it's like PGA needs a disruptor, right? They had gotten way too comfortable. They hadn't been challenged by anything that could rival them in terms of um, competition and obviously the the financial backing. So when live came along there, even though like some of the checks they were writing these guys, I was like, I don't even want to know where this kind of money is coming from because like that's an insane amount of I, like I get Phil Mickelson's a big name, but like dude, he's his best years are behind him. The yeah. kind of money he was, I don't blame him for going, but after the merger, it, it, and you've seen this a lot in business, so I get it, but it's kind of funny because like all the horrible things PGA said about Liv, some of which might have been accurate, some of which might not have been. Now they're like sitting on the couch next to him and they're like, buddy, give me a, let me give you a noogie there. The fast period is basically what it is. But <laughs> yeah. the, the thing I have is now the playbook is set because obviously if, Somebody, some bad person, say in China or Russia, just comes and is like, "Hey, we want to buy an NFL team." The NFL will be like, "Absolutely not." All you have to do is create a league. If you have enough money, once you take enough players, they're right. going to be like, okay, "We got to merge now." It happened with you know what was the league Trump ha- um, with Herschel Walker USFL. That's what happened with the NFL. A- NFL. I like think that you was know the AFL, league. right? Originally, a- ABA and NBA. There's been a lot yeah. of mergers in the past. Shit, but the these NFC were- and the AFC. That's what happened. Right. Yeah. These are actually businesses ran. I, you know, I wasn't alive back then. I don't know if one wasn't ran too well or whatever, or they're, I don't know the whole demographics of it, but this, this is way different. It feels like where it's like a company is like, it's, I would, I would say it kind of be like in the thirties if the Nazis would just come and start a rival golf league and we would have to shake. I, isn't it kind of like that? <laughs> I mean, I try to stay away from comparing anything to the Nazis, just in general. It's <laughs> washing to a T, where it's like, hey, we got a sports team. We're pretty up. I mean, we kill people, you know, not yeah. providing rules, but like that's what I'm just saying. It's a dangerous thing where I want the athletes to get all the money they want. They work their ass off their heart, but I still want the purity of the game just a little bit intact on some things, and I don't yeah. want Tiger Woods and Rory to play in ten livings. I, I don't want. I don't want the Saudi prince to be a member at Augusta. <laughs> like some of these things in in the contract, I was just like, my God, this is just like a dick measuring contract. Well, not- that's why I liked it for the, and maybe a short period of time is understating it. It was probably about a year. But that's why I liked it where they were just basically pushing PGA to be more progressive and make better changes and, and update the sport. Oh, yeah. Because there is a huge like younger demographic that is very into golf and they need to adjust because it is – it's a good old boys game for sure. Like, I mean, Augusta National is a great example. So I liked where Liv was pushing the PGA, but like we always say, competition makes everybody better. And if Coke and Pepsi merge, like both of their soda, I mean, both of their sodas will probably go to shit. If Marvel and DC merge, that would be bad for 
competition. So it's yeah, the free market so, aspect of it is gone. I totally get to the, you know, everybody's a, basically a hypocrite on the whole fucking thing. I get that. I'm just saying, I don't really have a problem with this. I'm just saying in 10 or 15 years, where would this go? That's like my, like, should we stop this now? Should we let it go? I mean, I'm all for more money. I mean, they have their hand in a lot of stuff that we use every day. I get that. I don't want those things to go away. <laughs> like I use them all the time, mm -hmm. but I'm also like, you know, where would this go? I don't want the NBA finals to not happen because of a fucking dispute over two governments. That's what I'm saying. Right. Yeah. That's that might be where that comes from. Okay? Where it's like, no, we can't have it because these two countries aren't getting along, and those two countries own the Houston Rockets now and the New York Knicks, and they're playing in the finals. We can't have it. I'm like, yeah, that'd be fuck? fucking weird. <laughs> then collusion starts to happen, and it's like it's a whole mess. Yeah. Oh, right, we'll have to keep updated on that. I didn't realize that was happening now. That trial. Oh, yeah, they're on Capitol Hill. There's a lot of things in america that's important but nothing more important than a love golf merger that's what <laughs> top of the list <laughs> all right we'll keep the train moving nate what's something you've seen recently uh i've got i won't go through all my stuff um but i'll pick and choose here and on the topic of uh trials and being on capitol hill we'll go with i watch jury duty um amazon prime original um anyone else i know jeff you're you're wanting to watch this uh, I've had this recommended to me by you, yeah. Brent Berry, and has Banner seen it too? He's watching it right now. Yeah. Okay. Geiger, you know anything about it? I thought you were talking about the Polly Shore movie, so no. No. <laughs> this wow. is a this is a, a reality series that came out, I think, this year. Um, yeah. so basically they put out an ad, almost like a Craigslist ad, for someone to uh to uh, participate in a jury um, that they were going to document. Um, they're going to do a documentary about a real jury. So they picked a jury and they got this guy. So the premise is everyone in the jury, everyone on set, the judge, the bailiff, they're all actors except this one guy. And he's brought in and then just fucking. But he all. doesn't know. Yeah. No, he doesn't know. Um, all hell breaks loose. There's one famous actor in it um, and he's playing himself. James Marsden is in it. <laughs> so that's kind of funny because he plays like a caricature of himself. He kind of plays like the. Uh, the asshole actor full of himself <laughs> and things like that. But um, man, it was a really cool idea and the way that they pulled it off really well. Um, there was some ridiculous shit that happens in this. <laughs> and at the end of it, they're like, how did you not know this was <laughs> real? And like, even at himself, like the last episode, they reveal it to him and they kind of show like behind the scenes and like this shit happened. He's like, how the fuck did I not? He was just like so in the moment. I saw this was like the most wild jury yeah. experience in the history of law. And they made him they made him like the four person of the jury. So like he had to speak and he had to give like um, the actual verdict at the end. But whenever they were deliberating, he had to like kind of lead everything. Um, <laughs> but it was a fun concept because they all had to like they didn't he didn't have a script. So they all had to react to him. And so like they had to adjust as they went on. And um, in that final episode, like I said, it's kind of cool because they say like, oh, you did this. And we had to like adjust and do all this stuff. And kind of like the ad lib shit they did. Um, so James oh, Marson got to use his ad libbing skills, which would be kind yeah. of cool see. It's almost like a, a long running punk. Yes. It's a good yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> eight, eight episodes. Um, one through seven is, is the trial, basically. Um, and the jury process and then the eighth one um, they go through kind of the behind the scenes and there's like something with COVID that happened and they had to like make up a lie and like have him stay in his hotel room for like an extra day one time and it was funny are they was, like 30 minute episodes uh yeah okay yeah, Not yeah i gotta check this out everyone's recommended it yeah definitely recommend that one uh you want to do another one or you want to just go like round robin um, yeah, I'll run back on one real quick. Um, let's see. We'll go with um, uh, Reality. Watched that recently. Can't remember. It's on some streaming service. Um, Sydney Sweeney. Um, it's a true story about oh, a yeah. NSA agent, I think, um, that leaked some files um, outside of the, the office building. Um, and what's really cool about it, and it's, it's really kind of a contained story. It all takes place pretty much at one location. Um, I think it's maybe like an hour and a half. It's not too long. Um, and I'm 99% sure this is what happens because I say it at the beginning of the movie. All the dialogue in the mo in the movie is taken that from a recording that they had when they were interviewing her. Um, they like show up at her house, uh, two FBI agents, and are questioning her about like these documents that may have got out, and they think she did it. 
Um, so, Did she work at the NSA? Mm-hmm, yeah. Um, and she thinks she was in the military. She was in the Air Force, maybe, or something like that. Um, but it's the dialogue is interesting. But I kind of dug it because, like, you could tell it was like just like people like talking in a conversation because it's taken from a recording and they just use verbatim what they had said in there. Um, yeah, it's like no one has written it in like a script format. It's a lot no. different to ask. no. And it's kind of it's kind of interesting how they like take it on and how they play it out. Um, but I, it's it's different. But I, I, w- I would recommend it. It's, it's good. You can knock it out pretty quick. Um, I thought it was a... It was so, a does it basically take place in real time, then, if it's, like, just the interview that they do with her? Uh, yeah, I would say 90% of it's real time, yeah. Interesting. I was just trying to think if there's anything, like, before or after. But, yeah, I'd say most of it's real time, just at her house, basically, while they're interviewing her and, like, bringing people in and, like, searching her house and stuff. So I saw the trailer, but I wasn't, like, quite sure what it was. But that now I'm a little more interested in how you described yeah. it. It's not your normal, normal movie, but it's a good change of pace. Cool. Reality. Is that on Max, you said? I think it's, uh, yeah, I think it is actually. Yeah. Okay. Sydney Sweeney and HBO have some deal. Euphoria, White Lotus, that. Yeah. All right. I watched um, season one, the only season so far of the Apple TV Plus show Shrinking with Jason Siegel and Harrison Ford. Have either of you guys seen this? I have not. No. Um, Cycli recommended it. It's good. It's really good. Um, Bill Lawrence, good things. Yeah, Bill Lawrence, the guy who did Scrubs and I think he's behind Ted, yeah, Ted Lasso also. He did this. Um, Harrison Ford plays his usual kind of like curmudgeon guy, but the point is Jason Siegel and him are therapists, and Jason Siegel is about a year removed from the loss of his wife and he has a daughter who's in high school and he's just sort of traversing getting back on his feet while like dealing with trauma while also like his job is literally to like fix other people's problems um it's a dramedy but i would say it actually leans a little bit heavier into the comedy aspect of it and i don't know the name of the actress but matt you'll know matt did you ever watch scrubs yeah so well, so Bill Lawrence, the guy who created Scrubs, his yeah. wife is – oh, my God. What's her name? She's in this, and she was also in Scrubs. I think in Scrubs she was like Dr. Cox's ex-wife. I have to look her up. Yeah, you'd recognize her if you saw her, but she's in this too. She's pretty good. Um, it was a pretty short watch. It was like eight 30-minute episodes, and we had a lot of laughs, a little bit of cries. Uh, I, say that again? Harrison Ford is, like, working a lot. Dude, right? He did the Yellowstone show. He did this. Obviously, Indiana Jones. He's in Captain like, America 4. It seems like he's just been was not doing anything for a while. And then he's like, okay, like, let's just... And he, he's done two TV shows the past two years, which is kind of wild. Did that Yellowstone show, he did get renewed for another season? Do you know? Well, I he probably died at the end. I don't... like. I haven't watched that one yet. Actually, I, I was going to bring up the last thing I watched was 1883. But um, those are like uh, just set time. So the next the next one would be like his son, you know, story or something or grandson. Or something. Interesting. Um, all right. I'll do one of these. I'm just going to mention because there's a video on our channel for it, but Banner and I, in preparation for the new Indiana Jones, we did a movie commentary on Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, which dropped, as you're listening to this, it probably dropped a few weeks ago, but it's on our uh, audio podcast feed and our YouTube channel, so go check that out, watch the movie along with us. Banner is the big indie head, and we're big short round fans, so we liked Yeah. We liked him in the movie. He's not... Uh, he can't carry the movie because the chick in it is fucking annoying. We Are you blast. watching? Would they? Do you think they could make that today, or is it too? Do you think it's too racist? Uh, I think it's too racist. <laughs> okay. Other than his accent or anything, do they make fun of him on certain things? Or, um, I, or... you know, he's actually the pro- not as bad as like the way that they treat uh, like the South Asians. Like he just goes, okay. Dr. Jones, Dr. Jones. But the, the guy like trying to rip. And, and everything. But that's just the way the kid talked because yeah. he's, in a, he's in a couple other movies too. And he just. 
he in Goonies? He's in something else. I don't in, know. Yeah, and uh, he was recently in. I think he actually might have won an Academy Award for uh, Everything Everywhere All at Once. Okay, all right. There you go. Um, all right, one other thing I want to mention, just because Matt, I think you'll get a kick out of this, and this already has a Broscar nomination for Best Documentary, but it's a three-part series on Hulu called The Ashley Madison Affair. Now, are either of you guys familiar with the website Ashley Madison? Obviously, you haven't used it. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't a user, but yeah, I understand what it was, yeah. That's one where you, you make a pro, it's like a match, but it's for married people, right? Yeah, bingo, specifically to cheat on your spouse. Other uh, married people, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, you, you have to be married to be on the website. Their <laughs> their slogan is literally "Life is short, have an affair." Can we can we can Banner post my username now? <laughs> <laughs> um, so the Ashley Madison affair. I didn't know this happened because this was like the Wild West age of the internet. But the website started in two thousand four, probably like a year or two after Match dot com and internet dating was like kind of becoming a thing because around 04 we were starting to get like more high speed internet and it was the internet was like an established thing like commerce had started over it and yeah. all that so the the point of the documentary and it's three like 40 minute parts but i promise you they're so engaging that they're going to fly by is it follows the ceo of ashley madison who surprisingly is happily married or at least that's what he tells us um but this guy is someone that Matt would love because he's an absolute psycho, but he's a pretty damn good businessman. <laughs> like, it, and so the best part about this, this is at least to my knowledge, the first time this happened, like on a wide scale. But Ashley Madison, um, the premise of the website is women could join for free. Men, when they joined, had to pay to message people. So I don't know the exact way the pricing model worked, but you would pay like $10 and get like 50 messages. But women could join for free because obviously you don't want it to be a sausage fest. You want to get as many women on the website as you can. Well, what happened was the first time that I had heard of this happening, but a hacker group basically like the modern day anonymous Mm -hmm. hacks Ashley Madison and emails the CEO. We have all of your data, everyone's username, all your messages, all of your emails, all of your staff's emails. You have 30 days to shut down Ashley Madison, or we're going to release everything. And the story goes from there. So I won't tell you what happens, but hearing it, about this, but yeah. they didn't ask for money. They just said you got to shut the water. They just said good. Correct. So, and, and I think their quote, like in the message they sent to the Ashley Madison CEO, was shutting down Ashley Madison mm-hmm. will cost you money, but not shutting it down will cost you more. And I think just the it was so early in the internet that like they called the FBI and they were like, Hey, we got hacked. And the FBI goes, what the fuck is that? Like you know, 2004, dude, I don't know what that is. What someone you hack to- you, like it, did someone like chop you with an ax. Yeah. Like what do you want us to do, bro? Like cybersecurity is just now starting. It would be like, if you called the police now, you were like, yes, yeah, someone shot a laser bazooka at me. Like what in the fuck even is that? I, how do we pull so no, we only have guns. Exactly. I don't know. Did you try putting an exclamation point in your password? Ooh, no, we'll do that. Thank you. <laughs> Click. But I just thought this was so interesting. And like they interview people who like had profiles on the website who like now, you know, are like, sure, you pay me to be in the documentary. I'll, I'll talk about it. But they have some employees from Ashley Madison. But the main thing that drives this is the CEO and what kind of a character he was. And then all sort of the fallout and how they respond to being hacked. Yeah. Um, it was just really interesting. I don't want to spoil it because I want you guys to see it and let me know what you think. But I highly recommend this. Especially it's first- scary how we communicate nowadays that like text message for, just to me and my wife. Like, I mean, if I'm not a person of interest, I don't believe. But I mean, they could pull everything that I've ever said. Oh, God. Yeah. That's yeah. why people who are like, I don't want that app. I don't want the government to have a picture of me. I'm like, bro, yeah. they have. First off, who are you? Why do they give a shit about you? Second yeah. off, they have yeah. everything. Yeah thing you know what who are you like if you're if you're not running for office or have a you know doing something illegal you should be fine but it is kind of scary sometimes to think about yeah and also you just freeze your bank account like i have no cash on me never yeah. no. no i'm not liquid at all i could take everything all right the ashley madison affair all right matt we'll go back to you and i guess everybody else can do one more and we'll finish it off what else have you seen if anything i watched and finished 1883 uh, the Yellowstone original with Tim McGraw, Sam Elliott. Um, fantastic. What a cast. And 
way better. Faith Hill is great. Fucking Tim McGraw is really good. Everything Tim McGraw's been in, I thought. Dude, Tim McGraw is a really underrated actor. He is. I mean, but the thing I've seen him in is like Four Christmases, and I guess he was good in the uh, Blind Side. I guess Friday Night Lights. He's great in. Right. Yeah. Uh, Great to watch. Um, The premise of it is something that everyone knows about that I've never really seen a movie about, and it's basically just Tim McGraw and Sam Elliott are just taking uh, foreigners across the Oregon Trail, and all the shit fucking happens. Like you know, snake bites, uh, getting smallpox get trying to get everything across the river um trying to avoid indians and stuff it's a fantastic thrill ride um a true western to me you know i've had my problems with yellowstone i enjoy yellowstone i like that they're bringing westerns to light it's sons of anarchy basically on horses but this, yellowstone is or this is yellowstone is yeah this show, I know you fuck. you nailed that one but do, so do you like these a little bit better because taylor sheridan has to he can't just do the Sons of Anarchy character template. He has to sort of get a little more creative. Well, and it's a, it's a true Western because after a while, Yellowstone's like, dude, this can't fucking happen nowadays. You can't just shoot a guy in the fucking street. <laughs> like, <laughs> and then run for governor next episode. You can't fucking do well. Okay, martial maybe, law. But but I mean, this actually happened like on the Oregon Trail and stuff like that. So that's where it's interesting, and it's kind of interesting, you know, how they ended up in um, Montana for the show and everything, but. It connecting to Yellowstone is one of the least interesting things about the show, honestly. It's just really- I mean, they're so like connected on the periphery that like I could just throw this on without having seen Yellowstone and still enjoy it, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Are these all on Paramount? Uh, yeah. it's on Paramount Plus. It's actually uh just started a couple weeks ago on Paramount Cable. Oh, sick! It's eighteen eighty three. To check it out. Have you have you seen the Harrison Ford one? Is that what seventeen? I'm watching that next. Okay. Nineteen twenty six. Oh, that one's okay. So that one's after. Yeah, twenty. Uh, so. I do like. I, I one thing I appreciate. Taylor Sheridan's like, look, people are so fucking dumb. Just so they know the order these take place in, let's just call them the year that they. Start. Yeah, I mean, it's a good. Yeah, <laughs> I, sure. I appreciate that. That's All right, funny. Nate. Anything else you've seen? Uh, yeah, let's see here. What do we want to end off with? Um, well, I've done true stories and reality, so I'll just stick with that theme. Um, actually, last night, watched The Good Nurse for the first time. Um, with Is this the one with, um, not Remy Malik? what's his face? Eddie Redmayne. Redmayne, Redmayne yeah. Yeah, and Jessica Chastain. Uh, yeah, based on a true, true story about, honestly, one of the, maybe the most <laughs> prolific serial killers in American history, which I didn't know much about, um, but a nurse that was killing people in the hospitals that he was working in. So um, I won't get, obviously it's a true story, so you can look it up, but I won't give too much away for any of the listeners that haven't seen this. I would highly recommend this one. Really good. Not that long of a watch for a a, a true life drama, um, but I, I love Jessica Chastain. So anything she's in, I love it. And uh, Eddie Redman, I think Redman did a really good job of playing this guy because this guy is a legit serial killer. As many people as he killed and how he killed them. Um, but like, when did this take place? Uh, like from, so the main part of the movie was like around 2003. Oh, um, that recent. Okay. Yeah. But he was in hospitals like early nineties into two. I think he had like a 16 year career in hospitals as a nurse. Um, but yeah, the, the way he plays this character, I guess this is the way the guy was in like real life. Like, you obviously know it's a movie and it's kind of pointed, you know, there's something fucked up with this guy, but like, he just plays like super normal. Like there's no hints of anything about him, like being weird until like the end when it starts unraveling. Um, You kind of know the story. So, you know, like what's happening, but like the way he played it was so coy, I guess. Um, I thought he did a really good job of of playing this character. And they, they were pretty much the main two characters in the whole, whole show, but they played really well together. They kind of develop a relationship and then, um, things start leaking and start finding out more facts. So it, it's really yeah. good though. Um, the acting has been all in it. Yeah. I love Chastain as well. And Eddie, Red, Eddie Redmayne, all, you know, he's made some interesting career choices, but everything he does to me is very interesting. Like the way he plays characters. Yeah, exactly. And that's, I think that's a perfect way of describing like the way he played this character too. Uh, Charlie <laughs> Cullen was the guy's name. Is this on Netflix? I think I saw it on there. 
It is. Um, and actually, right before I jumped on the pod, there's a like a hundred. Uh, there's like an hour and a half documentary on like the real life him, and we started watching that earlier. So, I'm gonna knock that out. Yeah, that's the sicko in me. I know Geiger does this too. After I watch some story about a psycho murder or serial killer, that's that's really just like the beginning because then it's the internet research and the YouTube videos that I spend a month of my life. <laughs> oh yeah, and then the two the two real life documentaries they made. Yeah. Therapy afterwards, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, that too. All right, I will end with this. Um, so speaking of How I Met Your Mother, which was one of my sitcoms that I drafted, How I Met Your Father uh, just had its season two finale last night. Uh, the last two, they aired two episodes at once on Hulu. And Nate, have you and the wife checked this show out yet? I can't remember if we talked about We've it. We've seen season one, have not jumped on season two. Um, there's just too much good shit out there that I want to see. I can't catch up. Yeah, and Hulu specifically, because yeah. I'm working my way through the bear also. But season one is good. Season two is gooder Oh, of How I Met Your Father. Awesome. The, season one, I felt like, um, while it has a lot of the uh, DNA of How I Met Your Mother, the actors really have not figured out who their characters are yet, which makes sense. A lot of times sitcoms yeah. have like this feeling out process in the beginning. Season two, while it also has some big uh, How I Met Your Mother cameos that fans will like and appreciate, uh, the humor just worked. The, these actors know how to play their characters now. Most of them are fucking hilarious, and I just love the concept of like a drama surrounded by sitcoms and sitcom situational comedy. And this one, just like its predecessor, How I Met Your Mother, takes place largely at a bar. So that's always good for sitcom humor. I highly recommend it. And season one was like 10 episodes. Season two was 20, but they're like... 23 minutes on hulu if you don't have the okay. commercials so yeah we enjoyed the first season um just i don't know got distracted and when the next one came out we never jumped back on but it'll be on the list at some point yeah and now luckily you can binge the whole thing i have been researching and um probably because of the writer's strike uh, we do not have word or confirmation on a season three yet but i did see that the show got picked up by uh freeform the cable network, which anytime a show gets like syndicated somewhere else, it's usually a pretty good sign as far as its ratings, even though it's a Hulu original, it's on free form now too. So yeah. Hmm. Okay. Nice. All right. Anything else? That, that's it for me. All right. That brings us banners, not here to announce the last segment of our show with his parrot impression, but do you even lift bra where we ask you a question and we leave you with our discussion of that question. It's our question and answer segment. The question we've been asking for probably about the last year and a half, what are each of the bros top 100 movies of all time? If you go to the description of this podcast episode, you will see the link there where you can keep up with our running lists of our top 100 movies of all time. Before we dive into it, Geiger, as always, if someone is either new to the pod or just kind of forgets, how would you describe these top 100 lists? Because if you're a film major who... Um, sniffs the butthole of the American Film Institute's top 100. This might not be exactly what you're expecting. This isn't Siskel and Ebert's top 100. <laughs> it's just movies that we've enjoyed throughout our life that maybe in a time of our lives helped us through a tough time or remembered from our childhood a little nostalgia or just a movie that we felt was the best movie we ever seen because we're into comic books or... or yeah. It's our list. You don't have to defend it because the movie just means something to so you. It's right because it's our list. Yeah, so shut the fuck up. All right, uh, on the list, the running tally. Uh, Nate, we'll go to you first. You can do a couple. Um, <clears throat> your last one that you counted down was your number 55 movie of all time, which was, I don't know if Geiger's already got to this one yet or if it's coming up on his list, but it was Tin Cup starring the aforementioned Kevin Costner and Rene Russo. Mm -hmm. So that was 55. What is your number 54 famous favorite movie of all time? Uh, coming in at 54 is going to be the Bradley Cooper American Sniper film. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I like a good like modern day war film. Um, there's like, I was actually looking at my list. There's a few more coming up um, pretty soon after this one. Um, but I mean, you've got Bradley Cooper, when he's, I think he's kind of coming into his element at this point. Um, and I don't know if this is the way Chris Kyle, the main guy in this, was in real life, but I feel like he nails this character. Um, I feel like he did 
from hearing things back in the day, did a ton of research. Um, I think he may have even like met with their family, his family. Um, he had the accent down. I know that. Yeah, he had. I mean, he had the accent down, and I mean, I've never been overseas in war or anything, but there's a lot of scenes in here that feel very real, um, and there's a lot of emotion from like his standpoint as, as a sniper and i feel like they really get ingrained in there of like a sniper just laying there waiting the intensity of that the stress that puts on you um some moments when he's literally about to pull a trigger on a child because he doesn't know if he has a bomb strapped to him or not yeah. um very high intense moments um i thought yeah bradley cooper in this movie did a phenomenal job um and I mean, clint eastwood you said yeah and when you got clint eastwood directing i mean it's probably gonna not gonna be a pile of shit so um, yeah, and I remember seeing this in theaters, and Chris Kyle is from Texas, Odessa, Texas, and like seeing this in theaters in Texas, and the very ending, th and this may be why it bumps up in, in, in my list. That's part like, of it, yeah. They have like the uh, funeral parade, they have like the real life videos of oh, like people in Texas holding flags over overpasses, and people like after the movie like standing up and clapping, and like it was, it was a really cool moment. Um, That's intense. And just even on top of that, I still think it's just a great movie and really well done. Did he get an Oscar nom? That's a great question. If he I didn't, he should have. All right, so that is your number 54. What's your number 53? Oh, sorry, real quick. He got killed at a gun range, right, on purpose or by accident? So, yeah, he was trying to – Chris Kyle, the, the guy who this is based on, um, whenever he came back, he tried to help um, other soldiers with, like, uh, yeah. post-traumatic stress. And he would take he would like take them in like go do things with them. Obviously, one thing he would go do with people is go to the gun range. I mean, that's the thing they do. They would they would shoot guns and go bond over that. Um, I mean, like the guy was mentally unstable and snapped and then killed him. Yeah. Wow. Jeez. Sad sad story. Sad ending, for sure. All right. Well, I guess we but, have to move on. But uh, <laughs> let's yeah, let's move on to a happier one. Yeah, can this be an animated movie or something? <laughs> You know, let me just shuffle some things around <laughs> real quick. Put your number 53. We go from American Sniper to Space Jam. No, I'm just kidding. What is it? Space Jam. Something <laughs> else in space, though. We're going with Solo, a Star Wars. Love it. So, oh. Yes. Yeah. You say no. You say no. <laughs> no, I said whoa. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Um, no, too. I love this one. I feel like this is one of the underrated Star Wars movies, but I love whenever they started coming out, Force Awakens. Um and uh, Rogue, Rogue One, One. Yeah. and everything, giving you more background. But this one has so much like throwback nostalgia and like seeing like the genesis of the Millennium Falcon, um, seeing where Chewbacca came from, seeing Lando Cal Calrissian as he, at a young age played by Childish Gambino, which seems like a weird casting move, but it was awesome and it worked. Um, and yeah, I just think it, it was overall a great, fun story. It kept moving. Um, it doesn't really slow down much. I, I like the missions that they have to go on. And then there's a ton of tie-ins at the end with, um, well, not a ton of tie-ins, the big tie-in at the end with Darth Maul. That I uh, had spoiled in the bathroom for me before the fucking <laughs> Yeah, movie. that you're revealed at the end. Um, I, but yeah, I think this is just such, so a, such a fun Star Wars movie that has a ton of background and gives you some context to some things. And one of the things that I... Sometimes we think it may be a, a distraction. Woody Harrelson in this is Beckett. I thought he did oh, a great yeah. job. Thank Newton, think, too. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would always think like that may be distracting because he's like such a big cameo moment of like an actor. But like I thought he did it really well in this and it kind of it really added to the cast. And I probably helped Alden as playing Han Solo, like kind of get into the role. So, yeah. So, skip ahead 30 seconds. Quick spoilers for Solo if you haven't seen it. But, I remember calling Matt after I, I saw the movie, like, the Thursday night it came out. I remember calling Matt, and I was like, hey, I just got out of Solo. And he goes, I don't want to see that piece of shit. I was like, <laughs> Darth Maul shows up at the end, and he goes, I'll look at Showtimes. <laughs> I went. It was really good, too. I <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, that fucking kid that spoiled it. That's a good inclusion, Nate. I'm glad that that made your list. Yeah, me too. I thought that was a solid one. All right, let's do... Uh, each you guys do one more. Is that cool? Just because of time. What number? Uh, uh, so Geiger, you just did your number fifty-three, which was one of my favorite comedies in Ted, which I quoted to start the show. So you're down to okay. fifty-two. But if you need a sec, I can toss it back to Nate. No, I, I'm good. All right, lay it on us. Kind of a good segue, I guess, from Solo, and that's Thor Ragnarok. Just give me time to connect them. But 
<laughs> Both have a semicolon. Yeah. So Thor obviously is part of a bigger universe, but sometimes I feel like Hollywood gives up on some of these franchises too soon. Because if Thor wasn't part of a bigger universe after Thor 2, there's no way they'd make a fucking fourth Thor 3. And Thor 3 is not even arguably the best movie out of all the Thor movies by Absolutely. far. Yes. And it's probably a top <laughs> 10 movie. It's so fucking good. Top and, five, I would say, but yeah. Yeah. With with Solo, it's something that that's not even a bad movie. I think it just got a bad rap, you know, and after what happened, I wish they would have maybe done a trilogy with it. It would have been very fucking interesting. However, back to Thor Ragnarok, my number 52. I was always a big fan of Thor, never Thor movies, though. Um, a big fan of Hemsworth in other movies in the Marvel Universe. I thought the first Thor was maybe a C-plus movie. Thor 2 was awful. I mean, it, like, just almost unwatchable. And then this one came out, and I saw the trailers. I was like, finally, a good Thor movie. And I went, a lot of people went, it made a lot of money for Marvel and it was the perfect, finally they, they always had the, the comedy, right? But I, I felt here was enough badass Hemsworth, enough badass fight scenes with comedy in it. I think they went a little out of control in the fourth Thor, but this one really worked. And with um, Goldstein who was in it and a lot of the actors and Korg, a lot of the comedy worked here. But there's enough, cool, you know, right. testosterone and shit going on, especially the opening fight scene and then the fight scene with him and Hulk and then the uh, third act. But a very well put together Marvel film. Yeah, this one was balanced. It combined the, uh, the, the comedic elements of like Love and Thunder with like the Shakespearean elements of the original Thor. Whereas as the first Thor is just too far up, up its own butthole. It's like a Shakespearean drama. And then the yeah. fourth one, Taika Waititi and Hemsworth have even admitted, yeah, we just had no restrictions. And it was just like us hanging out with our friends. We got a little out of control. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, yeah I think you guys both said it. That's the best way of describing it. Yeah, Ragnarok was the great, was the perfect mix. I love the, the line mix. from Korg where he goes, he's in that prison. And he's like, why are you here? Started a revolution, didn't print enough pamphlets, and here we are. <laughs> Only people who shop was my mom and her boyfriend Greg, who I hate. Boyfriend yeah, Greg. I'd say Marvel, you know, and DC's trying to do this, getting other superheroes in like a flash film or something like that. But Marvel does it so perfect where okay, Iron Man's in a Spider-Man movie, but it fits perfectly how they do it. Uh Hulk in this movie, Doctor Strange, obviously. You can't have that Spider-Man movie without Doctor Strange. So mm-hmm. how they actually fit in the other superheroes makes sense in the story. They're not just fitting them in there like, see that bat symbol? Come give us your money. <laughs> yeah, it all comes down to, I think, like, I get it's for marketing. Like, you got to put them in the trailers and everything like that. But, like, do they hijack the movie or do they just serve narratively like a nice purpose in it? Like, in Spider-Man Homecoming, I think we we're all a little bit worried in theaters. Is Tony going to show up at the end and, like, Peter's not really going to bail his own ass out and become Spider-Man like Iron Man's going to fly in and save the day. And luckily he didn't. Kind of the same thing in Spider-Man uh, No Way Home, like with Doctor Strange. He's like on the sidelines, but like you said, Matt, he's the whole catalyst for the story. So that's how you do it organically in the right way, and it's not easy to do all the time. <clears throat> all right, last one. Nate, what is your number 52 just ahead of Solo, a Star Wars story? Um, Just ahead of that... Um, we're getting even more happier. Straight comedy here. Perfect. Um, 1995 comedy classic, Tommy Boy. It's at 52 for you? Yeah. Wow. I know. I'm, I, I looked back and was like, maybe it's a little high. Strong high-ball. ass list. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, yeah, this one, this is like peak Farley. Um, I don't know if it gets any better than this. Um there's so many i mean I, we say this about so many of the comedies that make it so iconic but so many quotable lines that to that to this day almost 30 years later i still say a lot of like what'd you do i say that one all the time <laughs> whenever the door falls off all out only got diesel <laughs> oh gotta go to the next one tommy want wingy don't know to say that probably once a week just for shits and gigs um but yeah i mean this, this is peak farley um 
put Davis Bader right next to him as a good straight man and throw in Rob Lowe for some good looks, and you get a pretty um, pretty decent uh, formula for a good comedy here. I mean, I know Matt loves a good like sales comedy movie. To me, this was like the first one that I remember seeing that incorporate, and it probably wasn't because I guess like planes, trains, and automobiles, and a few others. But like my age, where I could like laugh at mm-hmm. stuff, this was like the first one. I was like, dude, sales can be pretty fucking funny if it's done like yeah. the right way with comedy. And like Farley, maybe one of the top five comedian, top five physical comedians ever. Maybe higher than that, top three. Yeah. Um, but this has so Chaplin, much Carey, Farley, I would say. Yeah. So it's many really, laughs. Like, yeah. him and Spade's dynamic was perfect in that film. It's really sad, though, that I don't think Hollywood knew how to use him. Like, no. Because he was, like, get, like, you see incarnate. But uh, because Black Sheep is the other one with him and Spade. Mm-hmm. Where it's, like, right. brother, it's basically kind of the same thing. And he had range. Yeah. You watch it, sorry, not live. Like, he could have done, obviously, comedy. I don't, I don't know. You know, if he would have lived, he could have maybe done serious movies. I don't know. But, like, I don't think they knew how to use him. It's like, okay, so he's just got to be this, like, blubbery kind of idiot the whole time. And that's, like, all he did, which was kind of sad. And that's what they did with Sandler for a while, too. Yeah, that's true. And as I was thinking about this, I was like, yeah, this is probably peak Chris Farley. But it was unfortunately a small window of the peak yeah. um, as his life was short-lived. So, and so was Spade. I- Oh, I mean, yeah, Spade is the sarcastic dickhead next to him. It's just perfect. One thing that I quote from this movie that, like, I don't even realize half the time is that his dad's wedding in the beginning when his dad's calling him up on stage. Right now, I need you, Tommy Boy. Dad, I don't think I... Okay. Okay. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. I've heard you say that a lot. I don't and think now I, okay. <laughs> And I always forget. Yeah, that's where that's from. It's great. And yeah, I always... Like, Rob Lowe is so perfectly cast in this as his stepbrother, but... He's been wanting his brother his whole life, so he just fucking smothers him to death. Brothers don't shake hands. Brothers got a hug. They're so great. Uh, well, yeah, I was surprised that's not higher on your list. Great comedy. Is there anything fun to do in this town? All you can handle, bro. <laughs> All right, uh, that's a really good one to end on. Tommy well, Boy. Well, there we go. <clears throat> Nate's number, what, 52? 52. Yeah. All right, before we let the people go for episode 208, our closing words of wisdom. Matt, we'll go to you first. They should make, a, they should redo Tommy Boy with Kevin James. The problem is this, of all the offensive things we've said on the podcast, that, that might be the one you really regret in like 10 years when your son is old enough to hear it. You're like, look, we all make mistakes. I guarantee you in Hollywood that's been brought up before. It's like, should we reboot Tommy Boy? Oh, yeah. I guarantee Who- who would the sarcastic guy be next to him? Mm. John Mulaney? I just do Dave or do uh, Jonah Hill and Michael Sierra in those roles. <laughs> I don't know if Jonah Hill could pull that off, though. At this point, Michael Sierra might be fatter. I don't know. Yeah, that's true. I think Jonah, uh, Jonah Hill's back on cocaine or something if you've seen recent pictures of him. Good for him. Great yeah. way to lose pounds before a shoot. Yeah. Nate, your closing words of wisdom. Um, let's see here. Um, everyone make sure and stay hydrated out there. You know, it's always important. Um, me, me and Horns were recently on a, uh, extended trip at an all-inclusive resort, made sure and ordered all of our waters, made sure and had water with every other drink of alcohol that we're having. So we came in on the other side. Okay. And, uh, I, I attribute that to the hydration, the hydration. So drink your water. Gotta lay off the sweets. <laughs> Gotta lay off the sweets. It'll get you. It's a truly funny observation. <laughs> Recently been taking baby aspirin. <laughs> you know, underrated scene in that when he's doing his bills and just has his fucking Chewbacca mask on. <laughs> 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 At his kitchen table by himself. Uh, I can't top that, so I'll just say just make smart decisions when getting your hair cut. Last time I went in, got it cut too short. Had a new lady. She didn't really know what I was doing. I'm starting to get to the point where it's like, if you don't have a barber, get one, because that's what I need, is someone who's consistent. It's just a yeah. mess there. That's, that's key. All right, for our enforcer in the paint, Matt Geiger, the American hero, Nate Thurman. I'm the mayor, Jeff Hornacek, and we are the Bro 4 Squad Podcast. Be sure to follow us on Twitter, and now Meta Threads, actually, at Bro 4 Squad. First time we've said that. 
We're also on Instagram at the same handle. Type in Bro Force Squad as three separate words on Letterboxd, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, Amazon Music. You'll find all of our stuff there. And then everything we've ever done in the history of time is on our website, broforcequad.com. Till next time, I'll see you guys at the movies. Don't spoil Solo for anyone. Do this again. It's been quite productive. <laughs>